How's it going? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I'm so excited to be talking with you today. Yeah, uh, well, I'm excited to be talking to you too. You, I, I loved your uh, uh, the note that you sent, oh. and uh, it's just very uh, very satisfying to know that Jimmy Neutron meant so much to you. Oh, for sure. I've been a <laughs> fan pretty much since it came out on VHS all those years ago, and I never stopped loving it. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, good. Well, thank you. Thank you for loving it. <laughs> <laughs> I still watch it all the time. So that's how much it meant to me um, growing up. So. Oh, well, thanks. You know, they finally just released it on DVD, the whole series. I saw that. I'm going to need to get it at some point. Yeah, it seems like it's only a few years a little late, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, better then, late um, than never, I guess. True. And then the movie is coming out on Blu-ray in a couple months as well. Right, right. I'll have to pick it up. I've I've uh, I've yet to see the movie. No, <laughs> no I've seen so it. I've only seen it like several thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> so far, I only have the VHS and the DVD, a uh, couple of video games, and that's about it right now. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I used to have some toys and T-shirts when I was younger, but I don't have those anymore. <laughs> yeah, I had a bunch of them. I still have some of them. Um, I donated a bunch of original art and materials and a bunch of the original merchandise to uh, Nickelodeon because they they created an archive, uh, like a vault to keep all this stuff in. And I thought, well, better that they have it so that others can enjoy it rather than it, you know, sink in a ship with me someday, so. <laughs> yeah, but no, I actually lost my toys in a fire we had all, on like a long time ago. Oh, so no. that's how I lost uh, my, my Jimmy Neutron toys. Oh, bummer. Oh, no, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah, but I kept the video games. I still have the movie, so that's all I got at this point. Yeah, good. <laughs> well, good. Hopefully so, I'll get back uh, to, yeah, hopefully so I've been looking on eBay, so hopefully I'll be able to get the toys back. Oh, yeah, you can pretty much find anything on eBay if you just look long enough. Oh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> so and you're I, on Central Time. What, what part of the country are you in? I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, you're in Central Time. So what part of the country are you in? Uh, Minnesota. Oh, you're Minnesota. Okay. So you guys get a lot of snow. Is it, is it snowy there right now? Oh, um, well, it's bright and sunny and kind of warm right now, but it's still a lot of snow and ice. Right, um, right. All of December, we had nothing but nice weather and no snow up until the last couple of weeks. Yeah, well, it's got to catch up with it sometime, I guess. Oh, yeah, for sure. But I don't <laughs> like living out here, so... <laughs> Well, my wife and I, we just uh, moved to Tucson uh, several months ago. Uh, and so it's a very different here, very deserty, and and uh, it'll still get really cold at night, uh, like deserts do, but it warms up really nice in the day. It's, and the uh, ecosystem here is just fascinating. Well, I would prefer the warm weather over the cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get a lot of people from Minnesota visiting here in the winter. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my uncle is one of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, how did you become involved with uh, working in films? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, I was lucky uh, because I discovered something I really, really loved early in life. Uh, I was in junior high, and I think I was in seventh grade at the time, either seventh or eighth. I think it was seventh. And uh, I went to an animation film festival. And not like cartoon character kind of stuff, but like art films. And I saw a film uh, that was stop motion. It was a claymation film called Icarus. And I saw it. And while I was watching that film, uh, I, it suddenly struck me like, oh, I know how they're doing that. And I never really heard of stop motion before, but I knew what they were doing. Uh, and I got excited. I went home and I got my parents' home movie camera. And I got some action figures I you know, had, and I started doing stop motion with it. And then I, I, I thought, I think I know how this is working. And then I took the, the, uh, uh, the film to the photo mat, because back in those days, you had to like take the film in, wait for several days for it to get processed, then you get it back. And then I'd play that film back and my action figures came to life and I was hooked. It was like, oh, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And, and from then on, I just wanted to absorb everything film. And so I got started uh, with an interest in film really early. Uh, so, and, and I realized at that time that, you know, it takes, it takes money and, and time to do this. So 
as I got older, I, I started a film club in high school and we would have fundraisers and make money to, in order to finance our little film projects and stuff. And, and so I'd always, I was always working on some kind of film and, and I didn't know that's what I was going to do for a living uh, until I uh, was in high school, really. And I started thinking, well, what am I going to major in in college? What do I want to do with my life? And um, yeah, it's, it, the question was pretty easy for me because that's where my passion was, you know? Yeah, I'm the same thing. I grew up loving films and I just become obsessed with all these franchises and a lot of those have really helped me growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure I mentioned that I'm actually on the autism spectrum. Uh -huh. So having all these characters and certain franchises um, kind of helped me see the world uh, in a different way, I guess. So uh -huh. I can understand that. So by high school, I knew that I wanted to work in films and I'm 24 now and I still haven't gotten there. But like you said, it all comes down to money. So yeah. college is kind of uh, very expensive. <laughs> uh. But I'll get there eventually. I'm just working on my own little project at home, uh, working on my computer and making art projects. Um, oh, that's great. And, yeah, the thing is, is that, you know, don't let lack of money stop you because really, you know, like when I was, uh, when we had our production company, you know, we had DNA for, for over 20 years. And uh, uh, what I would do when I would look to hire people, uh, animators or modelers or artists, anybody, uh, you know, if they went to college, great. But really, I wanted to see their portfolio. I wanted to see what their innate ability was. And oftentimes, you know, we get people come in that they hadn't been to college, but their portfolio was amazing. Like they had natural talent. Yeah, they were rough around the edges. They needed to learn you know, a little bit more about filmmaking. But, but, um, but yeah, don't, don't let the lack of money stop you or the lack of thinking, hey, I got to go to a certain school to get a job. Um, you know, in some careers, that's the case. But in film, it really comes down to, you know, what your innate talent is, uh, you know, your voice. If you're going to be a writer, director, you know, what, what is, where are those stories coming from? Or if you're going to be an animator, uh, I got to say, one of the most impressive portfolios I ever saw was from a, I think he was 10 years old when he came in one time, uh, 10 or 12, he wasn't very old. And this was back in the mid nineties. And we would get calls from, you know, it was back when our DNA was pretty small. We were answering our own phones all the time. And we would get mothers calling and say, hey, my, my son or daughter is a genius. She's so brilliant. He's so brilliant and, and doing this. And uh, can I come and, and introduce you? And sure, and they'd come down and they're like, uh, most of the kids were really, cute and, and very excited and great uh and that's fine but 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 this particular kid came in and he blew everybody away his mom had a garbage ba bag filled with these little flip books that he made so you know no computer no classes anything he would just do these little flip books and he had dozens and dozens of them and they weren't the typical flip books where you just kind of flip through and there's a bouncing ball and, and stick figures. Right. They were extremely elaborate. Wow. <laughs> and and I, I told his mom, I said, you know, your, your child is a prodigy. <laughs> I said, if he was older and hireable, we'd hire him right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, no, so, I have something of a portfolio myself. I been into drawing pretty much since I can hold a pencil or crayon or whichever. Mm -hmm. um, I recently just started doing digital work on my on my iPad. Um, so I actually recently just did a, a Jimmy Neutron picture. So I was oh great. Um, uh, I can show you if you want. Sure, you bet. Love to see it. I can just pull it up right here. This I was very proud of this piece because I knew I wanted to do something Jimmy Neutron related. And this one. Oh, that's that looks great. Thank you. Oh, really nice. So, did you do that? Uh, did you do that in Photoshop or? Uh, I use Procreate, which is an app on the iPad, uh, which is oh, like, okay. like an art studio kind of deal, and that's what right, I've been right. practicing with for two years. <laughs> oh, good. Well, that's the thing is that that you know really it's all about what you're passionate about. You know, if you're really passionate, I, I would tell people all the time, doesn't matter if it's film or whatever it is, 
but, you know, follow your passion because that's going to lead to your greatest successes. You know, if you try to, if you try to follow the money or try to follow, you know, money's important, of course, but still at the end of the day, and it's my belief that if you're going to be successful, you know, it's got to be something that you're really passionate about that's going to keep you working all those long hours that are necessary, particularly in production, uh, to get somewhere. That's some really great advice there. You're <laughs> the only one that's ever said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, you know, film business is, is tough. You know, any of the creative arts are hard. They're very competitive. You know, a lot of people are, are wanting to get into it. Uh, and, and because of that, uh, you know, it, if you have to be really passionate or you're not really going to make it because there's so much competition. Uh, I would have some, some people call and say, hey, I'm thinking about getting into animation, you know, and they had never really considered it before. They never were really passionate about it. It was just like one of many choices to them. And I would say, hey, if it's something you're passionate about, definitely. Uh, if you need to go and, and, and try it a while and see if it awakens a passion in you, then that's what you need to do. But, but to really be successful, you're going to have to have some kind of a, you know, creative link, you know, to it. Like it's got to, something's got to drive you more than just making money. Cause if you wanted to make money, there's so many other things that pay better for less, you know, <laughs> less oh, long yeah. hours. Production is, production is grueling. Um, like when we made Jimmy Neutron, uh, it was, it was the shortest production time I've ever heard for any animated feature. Uh, really? we, had, we had 24 months from the time I started writing the first draft of the screenplay until we delivered a movie, 24 months. And that's insanely fast. And it was insanely fast for, you know, back in the day when we made it because the tools weren't nearly as robust as they are now. Um, but, uh, but that's the thing is that we, we worked you know, 100 plus hours a week, everybody, uh, for, you know, a couple of years. <laughs> so you don't see friends and family much and, and you're just like in production, you know, seven days a week. Um, and but that's kind of what it takes uh, to, to get, you know, to get yourself, uh, uh, you know, to where you're, you're high profile enough. And, you know, for us being in Dallas, when we made the movie, uh, we had to jump through lots of hoops to be recognized because we weren't, you know, out in Hollywood. We weren't part of the big L.A. scene. We, we made the movie in Dallas. That's where my company was. And uh, my partner, Keith Alcorn, and I started it in 87 and just out of my apartment and uh, just the two of us with no money, <laughs> you know. And little by little, we would just cold call people on the phone saying, Hey, do you need a cartoon or something? And uh, you know, other production companies in town and ad agencies or whatever, and uh, just trying somehow to keep ourselves fed while we were pursuing our passion. And um, uh, so again, I, I I can't stress enough, you know, how important that is to find something you really love uh, because that'll sustain you in in the lean times, you know. That is some really great advice there. I'll definitely uh, give that a shot if I can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and when you say you made the movie in 24 months, I, I, I thought that was crazy because it usually takes so long to make an animation movie. And you yeah, have yeah. that fast. Yeah, we had a couple things in our favor. You know, well, uh, one thing is we had a pilot uh, because we, um, you know, originally pitched this, the show as a series idea. Uh, to Nickelodeon uh, back in 95, I think it's 95 or 96, 95, I think it was, uh, pitched to Nickelodeon. And um, uh, I pitched it as a series. And so they were definitely interested and wanted to do a pilot, but it took several years before, you know, all the contracts were done. They finally greenlit the pilot. Um, but then once we did the pilot episode, which is like, a, I think it was about a 15 minute episode, um, that's when everything went crazy. Um, this was back in 99 uh, or 90, I'm sorry, 98, maybe 98, something like that. So, um, so then, yeah, Nickelodeon said, hey, we definitely want a series, but we also want a movie. And, and it just, it became this whole big thing. And part of it was that a CG, you know, 3D animation was still so young and new back then uh, the studios really didn't know much about it or how it worked. I mean, Toy Story had come out, 
uh, uh, ants had come out. And I think that was it at the time. And so um, the producers didn't even understand how it worked. In fact, they, they were asking questions like, well, can you make a whole movie with the crew you have here? And I think we had, you know, 10 people. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 <laughs> we're gonna need to get really big and grow the company uh, because it was so new, they didn't, they didn't know. So uh, we were kind of on the forefront of that. Um, and we were also working with tools like Lightwave, which were uh, just off the shelf tools, which uh, no CG animated film had been made that way. You know, Pixar had their own proprietary software. Um, uh, uh, DreamWorks had their own proprietary software at PDF doing uh, ants, but we just had off the shelf tools that anybody could buy. <laughs> and, and uh, so we, and we did certain things that uh, helped that it, it did help that, like I said, we had a pilot done before the movie was greenlit so that we already knew the character designs. We already knew what the world was gonna be. Um, and so that was all, that was a lot of work that had already been done. So that helped us move fast. And the fact that uh, I was writing, directing and producing on it and owned the production company meant that we could move quickly. Like if changes, creative changes happened, you know, boom, I, I could re redirect production really fast. And so uh, that helped a lot. Um, and we also designed the movie uh, in a way that we knew it was more doable. We didn't try to uh, make the characters' designs too complicated. Uh, you know, part of the charm is to keep them simple anyway. And sort of my, my take on it was, you know, when I first started in film, I was doing a lot of stop motion, but I mentioned when, in my, when, when I was a kid. And I still did stop motion through college and, and some of our early commercial work, you know, I did stop motion in as well. Uh, but then I started getting experience with computers and realized that, oh, well, with computers and 3D computer animation, I can do better stop motion, <laughs> which means, you know, I'm not limited by the size of my garage or how much money I can spend on additional lighting. You know, all that was in the software. And so when we were designing uh, Neutron and uh, Paul Clearhout, uh, Keith Alcorn uh, did most of the character design work on that, designed all the characters and did a fantastic job. But we talked about that and I said, well, I kind of looked at this like a George Powell puppet tune almost, you know, it's kind of a, a retro uh, uh, design style that would also be simple enough uh, to allow us to do things that I knew that we could do with the software. And so. Uh, so yeah, we've made a lot of choices up front to give us the best chance of, of success and, and thankfully it, it worked out. Yeah, I did, for <laughs> sure. So when you were working on this film, how did you prepare to go through uh, all the animation? Uh, like, did you have to go through any kind of training or some new projects? Uh, yeah, well, you know, my, my path, is, I was pretty much self-taught uh, in regards to animation. I majored in film. Uh, in, in college at SMU in Dallas. Um, but the film department there was pretty small and it was kind of like, you know, here's some equipment, good luck, go make a film, <laughs> you know? So a lot of it was, was just learning by doing and, and I just did it a lot to where you can make all the mistakes and stuff and you kind of learn from that. Um, but um, I didn't, uh, the, the biggest training we had was just as a company, you know, as a company, you know, again, we started in 87, just me and my buddy Keith out of my apartment. Uh, by the time we made the Neutron uh, pilot, you know, we had about 10 or 12 people. Uh, and, uh, and then we were waiting to do the feature film to get that green lit. And in the time between then and, and, um, and the, the feature, we did longer and longer format projects. We did uh, uh, Santa versus the Snowman, uh, which was a, a half hour uh, ABC special. Uh, we did, did back in 97. So then that gave us a taste of like, okay, that's what a half hour format feels like, you know, in terms of production. Um, and then the, a year later in, in uh, 98, I believe, or 99, 99, we did all of the other reindeer. And uh, that was an hour long project. So now we've kind of, oh, we get a sense of what that feels like to produce an hour of content. Um, so we had these stepping stones as we headed towards doing the feature film. So by the time we got there, we were a lot better prepared to know how to schedule it, how to budget it, what we, what we needed. 
but we just we still didn't know everything we needed. I mean, it was, it was such you know that that feature film was on such a bigger scale that uh, that everything was instantly more complex. Um, but we just had a great crew. Uh, most of the crew were uh, a lot of them were, were local, and then we hired a lot of people from all over. You know, bringing people from LA, you know, across the oceans. <laughs> we brought in people from all over the place, um, and it was just a really fun exciting environment at the time we, we were all kind of learning together i mean I, I learned stuff from everybody on the production and that's true with every production that i'm on you always learn something uh from everybody in the crew and when it came to uh creating the world with jimmy neutron uh what inspires you to create this character well you know it's funny because um uh, it really is a, a, a personal film to me because where Jimmy came from, he grew out of my uh, dreams uh, in childhood, like fantasies I would have. Like I would think, wow, wouldn't it be really cool if I could build like a little robot dog? Or wouldn't it be really cool if I could build like a rocket and fly around? Or it, wouldn't it be cool if I had a jetpack, you know? Or And, and then uh, wouldn't it be cool if I could walk on the ceiling, you know, just just stuff like that. And then over time, uh, you know, much later when I got into the film, I started thinking about things that I, I really liked when I was a kid. And so I thought, well, what character could do all those things that I wanted to do? Um, uh, well, he'd have to be a genius, <laughs> you know, if he's going to build all this stuff. And so then it kind of grew out of that. It kind of grew out of my own sort of childhood uh, wish fulfillment. And then you kind of, then you start to think about the character. Then you start, okay. He's a, he's a boy genius, you know, make him young because there's something much more interesting about having a little kid who's like this brilliant genius rather than like a, an adult. Um, and, and what's funny is that you arm a kid with that much power and yet he's still a little kid. He still has to deal with all the, you know, schoolyard politics of bullies and, and you know, first kisses and, and you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and yet he's his genius. So he would always overthink things and try to fix things and make them worse because he's, he's impatient. He's just a little kid. Um, and that instantly stories just started, you know, come, coming out of that concept and, uh, and made it, made it easier to write for really. And was it easy to, um, what was easy to work on on this project and what was the hardest to work on? The, the, Let's see. I would say it was all hard. <laughs> um, the uh, the uh, some of the most fun parts are the very beginning of the project and the very end of the project. Uh, for example, like the um, uh, the very beginning, you're just blue skying ideas. Anything is possible, and it's really exciting to think what could this be. Uh, and then you start concept art, and all the art gets you excited. And it's like really, really exciting. Uh, and then you start writing the script and, and, you know, those, that's really your first few passes are so, so exciting. Um, and then you get into the actual production, the actual making it. And then that part is just like a, it, it, part of it's just a, a combination of a fight and a, and a foot race. You know, <laughs> you're trying to get this, all this material out uh, by the deadline. Uh, but then at the end, you know, your work is done, you know, the, it's in the can. And then you get into post-production, which gets you know uh, scoring uh, the, the project, adding music, adding all the effects, and then it just comes to life in front of your eyes, and that part's so exciting. Um, but uh, you know, I would say probably um, you know another thing that made the project really fun was doing it in Dallas created a nice little buffer for us. Like um, the studios. You know, it's kind of a Paramount took a risk on us because we were just a little small studio in Dallas, and uh, suddenly they're giving us millions of dollars to make this movie, and trusting us to make it. Um, to their credit, or I guess maybe to our credit too, it's like they never actually came out and checked on us or kicked the tires. They they liked what we were they were seeing and the footage we were sending them, so they never came out. But that that sort of buffer sort of keeping all of the execs in the studio kind of at arm's length, had a little creative cocoon for us in Dallas. And I think that also helped us uh, have, have a lot of fun. And, and uh, it felt like it was kind of made by like a mom and pop shop. You know, we, we had about 65 people. Uh, we blew up to about 150 people during the, the height of 
the production on Neutron, but it still felt like we're just like a mom and pop shop and, and everybody felt like they can contribute. And it was just a really good environment. And when you mentioned the, the music, I have to say, I love the soundtrack. I have to listen to it all the time on YouTube, but uh, I don't have a physical copy of the CD and iTunes doesn't have it. Right. Um, so I have to say, um, how did you come up with the music for the movie? Yeah, well, that's all John Debney. Uh, John Debney, who's, who's our composer, uh, met him through uh, Jeff Carson. Jeff Carson is a, a, a music editor and supervisor uh, who was fantastic to work with. He really helped me a lot on the project. Because again, first time I'd ever worked on a, on a feature film. First time I'd ever worked on one and I was directing and writing and producing. <laughs> so I had, so I was all ears and, and uh, in terms of my crew and people would bring on. So I learned a lot from Jeff and I learned a lot from John. And uh, when, when you work with a music supervisor, what they do in animation is they'll pull temporary source music so you can cut it into your animatic. So you can sit and watch the movie play with music and everything. And a good music editor We'll edit that those music tracks to where it, it feels like it's scored. It feels like a real movie, which is great. That's what you want because then when you're showing it to the studios and they're watching it, it feels more like a movie to them, and they can really concentrate on on giving you good, clean movie notes. You know, they're not being bumped by the music or whatever. So anyway, uh, once Jeff worked with me and created this temp score, uh, then that sort of became the template to have a conversation with the. Uh, uh, the, the composer, John Debney, in this case. And, and John totally got what we we're going for, totally got the tone of the film, and just just did a great score. Uh, I loved what he did for it. In fact, I love working with John so much, uh, I used him again on my next feature, uh, The Ampoli. Uh, oh, he, yeah. did a, he did another equally great score for that. <laughs> <laughs> and the soundtrack was really good, too. You put on a lot of great music, uh, like Kiss in America and Blitz Rip Pop. Uh, rock, I can't remember. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and I got. Yeah, oh, well, I got a comment about the. Uh, yeah, so. So uh, there's a lot of uh, songs in, in the soundtrack too. Is that at the time Nickelodeon had a record label, uh, and they were uh, had some uh, artists uh, uh, in their uh, in their in their uh, stables. So they're they're trying to you know get into some of their films. And so a lot of these songs, like you know, uh, "Kids in America," uh, was covered by another uh, girl group, you know, for the um, uh, for Neutron. And what was funny about that song, and they did a great song, a great job on the song. The song's great. But what was interesting is that John Debney originally uh, that whole launch sequence in the amusement park was all score, and John wrote a terrific score for it. It's like very exciting, very cool. I loved it. And then when I found out Nickelodeon wanted to replace it and put the song in there, I was like going, oh, oh the score is so great. Um, and when, so when the song was first put in there, I, I was not a fan because I, I missed John's score. Um, but then something funny happened. Um, and funny, well, not funny, haha. It was, it was a tragedy that happened, but it was interesting. 9-11 uh, happened. So 9-11 happened right before Neutron was released. And it was during that, that time where we were doing our sound mixing and, and uh, the score was being recorded. And suddenly that whole scene with that song, Kids in America, took on, took on a whole new vibe uh, in the film because of what was going on in, in world events. And then uh, I absolutely loved it. I loved it in the movie. Uh, it had a different feel. It, it meant something different. And, and uh, I, I, I love the way it works in the film. I, I do too. The music has definitely been, I have, um, excuse me. Uh, the music definitely been very good for the movie. And I just yeah. love listening to all the songs. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy Neutron came out uh, like over 20 years ago. And it's uh, still really popular and loved by a lot of fans who grew up with the franchise. And uh uh, there are new people discovering it uh, every day now. Um, it's hard to believe it's been that long. <laughs> oh, I know. Like bored when it came out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I just, what how does it feel like it's been 20 years or? Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's really weird. Uh, you know, I just turned 60. Um, my wife and I did just uh, a few months ago. 
And it's kind of funny because I, I never, I always think I'm just a big kid, you know, I, 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 uh, I never quite grew up. Uh, and I never thought about getting older. It never really phased me until I hit 60. Then I kind of went, hmm, 60. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, uh, 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 what was I going to say? We were, you're asking me a question. I, I got off track. I was asking, how, does it feel like it's been 20 years since? Oh, our... that's right. So, so yeah. Um, and I feel like this is about a lot of things now is that it feels like it was a hundred years ago and simultaneously it feels like it was yesterday. It, it, it feels both ways because on the one hand, it feels like it just happened. On the other hand, I, it feels like, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff has happened since then <laughs> that it felt like so long ago. Yeah. So it's an odd feeling. Well, well, with that, you cut out there. Oh, I said it's kind of an odd feeling because it, it feels all at once, both really long ago and only like yesterday. Oh, yeah, uh, I can it, definitely see that. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's uh, Jimmy Neutron is still getting fans, uh, new fans every single day. Are you surprised that there are fans that are still loving it, old and new? Yeah, well, you know, there's, uh, it's funny because I have friends and crew and people that I work with that, that work on the project, they'll forward me stuff all the time about, you know, all these fans and petitions to get the show re rebooted and all this kind of stuff. And there's like, <laughs> that is my next question. I was wondering what your thoughts are about that. Oh yeah, well you know it, it's uh, it's kind of uh, uh, sad in a way because we had an opportunity to reboot it about two years ago. Uh, we had a real chance. Um, Nickelodeon was very in, into it, you know, very into the idea. Uh, they said, "Hey, we got to get the, we want to get the band back together." You know, you and Keith and and Oda Kirk and the whole everybody and and I said, "Yeah, you know what? We're all willing to." to do that again. We're all really you know, willing to do that. Oh, great, they get all excited. And then we're thinking, okay, this is gonna happen. Um, and then you know how it is in, in Hollywood. And uh, suddenly, you know, one person says something and, and, and then all of a sudden the whole thing just fell apart. Um, and uh, which is really too bad because you know, if I've learned anything in this, in this business, it's that Hollywood loves to remake success. Yeah. And, uh, and knowing, what I know about the the amount of uh, uh, the fan base out there, and the fact that we have everything we need, you know, the creative are willing to get back together. All the voice actors are still with us and, and eager, and it would be like printing money, you know, <laughs> in Hollywood talk, because uh, you could make the film that would not be an, an, an expensive film, um, and so yeah, it's or or to reboot the series. Um, so who knows, who knows, you know, uh, you know, I was all up for it, you know, um, and uh, I think that we had some really great ideas, uh, but it's up to you. Know, we don't own the pro project anymore. Um, you know, I, uh, DNA, uh, my company that I owned with Keith Alcorn, uh, you know, we developed a property and owned it. And then we had to sell it to, to Viacom, which owns Nickelodeon, uh, sell them the rights to actually get the movie made. Uh, because they wouldn't make it unless they could control the rights, which I understand. Um, and so, but now that makes it their decision. So I, I really don't have any say in whether it gets made or not, okay. other than if I would work on it or not. <laughs> well, if they can re reboot like uh, iCarly or Rugrats, I'm sure they're, will they're willing to do it for Jimmy Neutron at some point. Yeah, so we'll see. Who knows? You know, maybe there'll be... Uh, you know, personnel come and go at Nickelodeon all the time. It depends on who's making the decisions over there and, and what the, the, the climate is like. But uh, yeah, to me, it always seemed like a, like a no-brainer. I mean, I hate that term, but it, it, it's kind of apropos in this case. But for whatever reason, it didn't happen. So, so who knows? But who knows? never say never. <laughs> yeah, that's Hollywood for you. It's yes yeah. or no, one way or the other. Uh -huh. um, so I got a couple more questions here. Um, do you have a favorite animated film or TV series? Uh, let's see. I think um, probably one of my favorite animated films. Uh, uh, I, I'm a huge Miyazaki fan. Uh, so I like pretty much everything Miyazaki did. But uh, uh, oh gosh, I just went blank. 
This is what happens when you turn 60. Uh, Princess Mononoke. <laughs> Princess Mononoke is one of my favorite animated films of all time. Uh, I absolutely love that film. Uh, and I, one of the reasons I love Miyazaki's films in general is they're not told with a typical Western voice because, you know, obviously you're Japanese. Um, and that in and of itself is, is interesting because, you know, in Western style storytelling, there's a clear villain and a clear hero, you know, in, in Westerns, you know, the good guy wears a white hat, the villain wears a black hat. Um, but in his filmmaking, not necessarily so. And like in Princess Mononoke, there is a villain character, but she's not a villain. She's actually doing what's best for her people. And, you know, everybody has good and bad in them. Right. And, um, and again, that's one of the things I love about his style of filmmaking. Um, and that's why Mononoke is one of my favorites. You know, it's visually spectacular. I love the characters. Um, of course, I love his other movies like, you know, My Neighbor Totoro and, and uh, Kiki. All of those are so, so magical to me. And, and ironically, they're all 2D as, a, as a compared to, to 3D. <laughs> um, other than Jimmy Neutron being my favorite, I definitely get a kick out of the Rugrats or a bunch of Disney projects. I just have so many favorites that I just always pick just one. Right, right. The art of animation is just so beautiful to watch that uh, you can watch it over and over again. You just love it each time you watch it. Yeah, I used to love, uh, you know, back before VHS tapes, <laughs> back before uh, you could just uh, uh, watch pretty much whatever you want to, like on back before the internet, um, the only way to see uh, animated shorts other than like Saturday morning kind of cartoons would be go to these animation festivals, you know, that I mentioned earlier on when we were talking, I went to go see this animation festival that, that had this short Icarus in it. So I used to go see a lot of these festivals when they tour around um, and they were all like award-winning shorts, you know, a lot of them from Canada or from Eastern Europe, just all over the place. And um, uh, there was a few companies that would put together these festivals and they, about once a year, uh, they would tour out, like Animation Magazine, those guys, uh, they used to distribute, put out, I think, Animation Celebration, things like that. Um, because that's the only way you could see these animated shorts were in the theater. They, you know, we didn't have, um, uh, there was no cable TV. <laughs> there was no, uh, there was no internet. Um, and so that's why I would go to these festivals. And when you go to these festivals and see these, um, they're not like Saturday morning cartoons. You know, they're like little art projects. Some of them are definitely little, little pieces of art. Um, and it exposed me to a different type of animation. You know, I, I grew up watching Saturday morning cartoons like, like everybody else, but then you see this whole other world of animation uh, where it's taken very seriously. And some of, some of them are just beautiful little tone poems about, you know, just impressionistic, you know, uh, water running down a river and just kind of, <laughs> it's very, it's not narrative necessary. It's not like, you know, wacky, you know, cartoon characters. And so uh, that's another thing that got me excited about the medium uh, because animation is a medium where you can do anything really because you you are controlling everything you can hand draw it or now you can use computers but you dictate everything dictate the world everything and so um uh i'm often uh frustrated or i used to be years ago by the fact that um like when you're pitching to a studio since since toy story was a hit they wanted everything to look like toy story like all the cg should look that's the design sensibility and I go, yeah, it looks great, but there's so many more looks you can do. That, that's one of the reasons why I uh, went after uh, all of the other reindeer. You know, one, we needed to, uh, to get some production in to, to last a year until the, the, the Neutron film got going. But more than that is the ability to try to use 3D tools in a way that you're not used to seeing them used by using, you know, cut out flats and all this stuff. And, I think later you got to see more of that with like flash animation and stuff. But, you know, back in 99, uh, that was a little more unique. Uh, so yeah, I just use that as an example of that with animation, there's so many different looks you can achieve, so many different styles, so many different techniques um, 
that uh, I like to see that mind more. And that, that's what I used to see in those animation festivals. There's a whole variety of different techniques. Between 2D and 3D, uh, there's so much to choose. Uh, what yeah, is, stop what motion, and cut out, and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. And my last question, are you currently working on any other projects at this time? Yeah, so right now I'm, I'm trying to take it easy these days and work, only working on things that I'm really passionate about. There's that word again. Yeah. Um, and uh, right now I'm working on a documentary, um, helping out, there's a, an artist, uh, his name is Paul Lair. Uh, he was a science fiction artist. And as you can see the background, I have lots of old vintage science fiction art <laughs> and uh, have collected that for, for a number of years. Uh, Paul Lara, he was um, he was one of a handful of, of science fiction artists that I just completely loved. Uh, Richard Powers was another one, uh, but Paul Lair, uh, he passed away in the in the nineties, and and uh, his estate reached out to me a couple of years ago uh, about doing a documentary, and I said, well, I love your dad's work. Uh, I would love to be involved, and so I'm I'm currently producing and helping them uh, with the documentary uh, on Paul Lair and his his art and his life. Well, that's fantastic. I wish you the best on your project there. Yeah, thank you. And I, uh, I'm really glad we got the chance to talk today. I really had a lot of fun talking with you, talking about Jimmy Neutron and animation. It was definitely a lot of fun. Good, good. Well, great talking to you too, and, and, and uh, wonderful to meet you, and I wish you all the best. You too, it was great to meet you too. All right. All right. Well, thanks, and if you, if, if you need anything else, feel free to reach out anytime. I will. I'll reach out yeah. to Facebook and I'll let you know when the interview is uploaded. Okay. Sounds great. All right. Have a good one, John. Yeah. Good talk to you, Val. Good talking to you. Bye. Bye-bye.